Welcome to the Chris Stefanik Show. Everybody has got to forgive somebody. And yes, I'm talking to you. And if it's not a particular person, then maybe right now it's just society driving you crazy. You know, and so often we don't forgive people or groups of people or the world because we kind of think that forgiving means reconciling or just admitting someone else won or uh, letting someone else back into your life and letting all your boundaries down that you have a right to have to protect yourself. We have all the wrong understanding about forgiveness. And so we don't let ourselves experience it. Listen, forgiveness isn't about all those things, though. Those are fruits of forgiveness. Forgiveness is about you having the freedom that God wants you to have to go through your everyday life. Uh, And we all need to forgive somebody. All of us. I had this mind blowing spiritual experience last year. Uh, a priest came to my house and I didn't know the burden I had in my soul and what I needed to forgive in my life. And he led me through this prayer that I've used as a spiritual tool in my spiritual tackle box ever since that I pray regularly in the spiritual practice of forgiving that act of the will of forgiving so that I can experience not necessarily reconciliation or letting someone back in my life, which is great if that actually happens, but so that I can experience the freedom of not carrying burdens around. And I want to share that freedom with you. We created an incredible program because of that experience that I had uh, really shortly after it. And and it was actually mind blowing. Within days, we're filming in the studio, had this beautiful four part program that about 100,000 people signed up for. By the way, if you're not a missionary of joy, please become one. Go to reallifecatholic.com. Follow all the tabs and links to become a missionary of joy because it's because of you, monthly donors, missionaries of joy, they were able to offer that program to the world. So anyway, went through this, uh, this experience, created this beautiful program from it. Uh, and I want to share one of the episodes in the program with you. I encourage you to follow the links under this video, or if you're listening, the links in the show notes to watch the whole program. Because in the last day of the program, I, uh, we share with you that prayer that I went through that I want you to make a regular part of your life so you experience that freedom. But the episode I'm going to share with you today is one of the most powerful, profound conversations I've ever had. Honestly, it's about 45 minutes or so. Buckle up. A lot of deep stuff. Maybe it's an hour. I'm forgetting how long it is. Uh, buckle up, guys. There's a lot to take in. And uh, I just I just want to give it to you so that you begin to, to just think about what forgiveness actually is and dive into this powerful spiritual freedom that God is calling you to have. As you guys are watching this, you might be thinking of someone who you know who's carrying around the burden of unforgiveness. I encourage you to hit share and to forward this to somebody you love. I love you guys. That's why we share all this stuff with you. Thanks for watching. But thanks for being here, by the way. Thanks for having me. I love you guys. I really do. It's a gift to just be sitting in this couch with you. And I would say that even if the cameras weren't rolling, I actually just literally mean that. <laughs> you will. It's, well, it's a gift to be with you guys. So, yeah. so let, we're going to dig into the Word of God, and, and we're going to go through seven scriptures that have to do with forgiveness, uh, just to give people something to chew on later, right? And and it's and, but there's a difference between just studying the Word of God and really letting him speak to us through his words. So before we dive into these, how do, how do people then take this stuff and then say, okay, I wanna now take the scripture and let God speak directly to me. How do you read the word to where he's talking to you? You're, you're a professional at this. I, you're you're supposed to be a professional at this. <laughs> I, well, it, well it, it, comes, it, it comes to presence, right? Or it, will I be present to what is said? Or will I hear it? Be present to what is said or yeah, just hear, or hear it. it. Anybody who's married, you know, or has children <laughs> knows what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're talking to your children, did you hear me? Yeah. Or, you know, I heard you. No, are you listening? Yeah. Or, no, no, I heard you. No, my, and my wife is like, because she can tell the scale. She's like, 10% of you is not here. Yes. And, yes. and she's literally right every time with the percentage yeah, and everything. Awesome. Like, she awesome. nails it. Yeah. yeah, so how can we be present to what is being spoken to us because it's the living word. And, and just as you can, you can read that same verse over and over again, it can speak to you differently each time if we're open to being spoken to. And, and that's really the thing because you, you, you know, you say I'm a professional, but a lot of times I don't, I don't want to hear it. I struggle with my own conversion. I struggle with living it out. You know, it's not easy. Being a Christian is not easy. No. It's a challenge. It's a hard. And I don't, I, I think saying that up front is important yeah. because for so many of us, specifically as we get into this issue of forgiveness, like there's some people who it's hard and there is some serious, serious trauma and serious, serious hurt. And it's big. It's not just, it's not just distractedness. It's like, I don't want to hear this. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so we have to have this fundamental posture with God that I trust you. 
that what you're telling Ooh. me, even if I don't want to hear it, yes. I know it's good for me, yep. and I'm going to lean in. How do you? How do well, you? Well, I, th- I think that's the root enemy. That's the root strategy of the enemy, right? Is convince us that God's not a loving Father, that He doesn't really have our best interests in mind, and that we'd be better off without Him. So, I, I think He, uh, the the Word of God, is meant to be acted on. And I think that's one of the big poverties in, you know, many circles, partic- particularly in a lot of Catholic churches, is we're, we're not reading it like this as something that is uh, an invitation to respond to, an invitation for me to put this into action. You know, wh- wh- where is that scripture? Is it in James? Like when, yeah. when you hear the word of God and you, you put it into it. action, yeah. otherwise it's you're like, like looking so, at yeah. yourself in the mirror yeah. and walking away and promptly forgetting what you look like. Yeah. yeah. Or like telling someone who's hungry, good luck, be warm and well fed, and then yeah. walking away. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Okay, so Lord, we trust you. Speak to us through your word and, and help everybody who's going to see this or listen to it to actually take this stuff and let you talk to them. All right, let's dive in. We're listening, Jesus. We're listening. All right, this, this is uh, Matthew 18, 34 to 35. Jesus talks about uh, a, a guy who owed a debt to his master he was forgiven the debt. Then he found someone who owed a debt to him. And he's like, give me the debt. And then the master's like, hey, no, 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 that wasn't cool. And he throws him in jail. And he ends it with this. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And what struck me here that I want to talk about is the, the from your heart words at the end. And, I, and this is a key to doing good. Lexi Divina is like, just go with what strikes you. And that's what God's saying. Uh, from the deepest depths of the heart. What does that mean to forgive someone from the heart? And the, the, and the reason I, I actually grabbed you to come in here is because I had an experience the other day that I'm going to let everybody in on. So why don't you answer that? Yeah, okay, so... <laughs> because, I mean, I could answer it, yeah. and I could, give you a, I could give you the abstract answer. Actually, I want to hear the abstract, and then I'll well, tell my experience, and I want you to, to share about what happened with Meg, too. I yeah. just, for me, it's like to forgive from the heart. You know, we talk about the human person as, as, as a intellectual person, an emotional person, a spiritual person. And when we, when we engage the entirety of our person, cognitively I can make a decision. Yeah. From the depths of my emotions and the depths of my spirit, am I willing to say, I forgive, I choose to forgive. So it's being present to yourself, mm-hmm. it's being present to the pain, it's being present to the realities, it's being present to all of these things. Here is the carnage that this cause, big or small, it might, it might be a little, you know, a little bump, or it might be a huge issue. Yeah. But to letting be yourself to that, feel the pain of what being happened. present to it, not adding or taking away. Yeah. And then, and then saying, as our Lord said, or in your own words, I forgive you. Mm. It doesn't mitigate what was done. It doesn't make what they did okay. But it allows that separation and allows you just from the from the totality of my I am. Mm. When I say I am, that's the entirety of who I am. Pluses and minuses, strengths and weaknesses. That's that's Father Ken Geraci. It's all right here. This is my I am. And from my entirety, I can say, I forgive you. And if I'm only doing it intellectually, or if I'm only doing it from a selfish place that say I forgive you, then there's there's this absence that's missing there. But but, but when you add to that, though, and, and maybe this is getting more concrete with what you're saying, Please. but it's that's an incremental progress, right? Like initially, in my, in my in my experience, forgiveness starts with a decision, and frequently my feelings, all of me is not there yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I, but I choose. I I know from what God has revealed. I trust what God says. I'm trusting in in this reality that actually holding on to unforgiveness or resentment is only going to hurt me. It's actually not going to fix the situation. It's not going to hurt the other person that I'm angry towards or whatever. So I choose to forgive, and eventually the rest of me follows that choice, Yeah. right? Um, but sometimes that takes a lot of time. It could take you a know, lot like of time. I, I've, I've, I've had some situations in my life where it's taken years. Yeah. I, did, I keep choosing to forgive, choosing to forgive, and asking the Lord for the grace for the rest of me sure. to follow that decision, yeah. sure. right? But it's a, there's a profundity here uh, that I, I honestly didn't expect that answer. 
uh, that, that you gotta be present to yourself. And, and I, I think sometimes we think, you know, Christian forgiveness is about, well, stuff it, stuff yourself. It's like, no, actually, and, and this can be a major journey, especially if it's from a major trauma, get to a place where you can look at the pain, yes. really feel it, and then you have the capacity to really forgive. And I think a lot of people just, well, no, forgiveness is push it aside. No, 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 it's okay. But, yeah. but when we go into that pain, you're not going into it alone. You're going in with our Heavenly Father, with our Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. You're not alone in your pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as like we say about the Trinity, theologically speaking, where one person of the Trinity is, all three are present. And so as Christ is there on the cross, he's not alone. Mm -hmm. And so wherever we may be in our hurt or woundedness, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And th th there was a... a, a Majorly powerful experience of the day, which you know of, <laughs> and it's why you're sitting here right now. Yes. <laughs> Father Ken just happened to be in town and I invited him <laughs> to pray over my daughter who has MS, little knowing that the Lord brought you to, because I needed this, and I didn't feel like I did. <laughs> That's the weird thing, man. I didn't either. We just show yeah. up and do what God wants. There was, this, there was this really graced moment where, um, like, you just looked, I don't know how you saw this, but it's a, it was a grace. It was a grace. It was a it's charismatic great. gift in the moment. You're like, you need to forgive somebody. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I literally like, I don't feel like I do. Cause I, I know the wounds from, there's some childhood wounds uh, that, I, that I felt like I had mostly forgiven to where it wasn't bugging me anymore. I'm functional. Right. And, and, I, and I actually, the, one of the only reasons I gave that credence is that there's a religious sister who prays for me often, who has told me repeatedly, you need to forgive. And I'm thinking, whatever, I don't feel it. I don't feel the, but you, as you, as you prayed over me, and led me through this meditation that we're, we're gonna, you're gonna lead people through later. I, I actually entered the pain, I owned it. Yeah. And, I, and I was present not only to that, but to the Lord in a deeper level. Yeah. That I, I, I didn't know it was there because it was mostly gone. And here, this is something so insidious about sin, about dysfunction, about non-forgiveness. When it's mostly gone, you're actually convinced that you're fine. <laughs> but an image that you brought up was like, no, no, dude, you need to, to empty the drainage plug. And I've been thinking of this ever since. When it's not from the depths of the heart, that's like having a layer of scum on the bottom of a sink. And let's pretend you did that, like went on a vacation for five months and came back home and you left a, just, just five inches, just three inches, just one inch of water on the bottom of the sink. What's that gonna look like? It's mostly empty, but just that bottom inch. And I, and I realized after that prayer, like the Lord's saying, no, I want from the depths of the soul, zero unforgiveness, none. None of, none of that, that in your soul at all, yeah. none. And uh, it's, it was almost, it was weird when you were done, I almost felt like normal again. I'm like, and yet there's something that was in my, the back of my head on constant replay that wasn't there anymore. And as you're saying this, I think it, it kind of ties into this early part of the conversation. <sighs> Sorry, it's heavy, man. It's like, yeah, I, exactly. anyway, same thing. I'm like, I'm gonna take a nap now. Well, it was, it's like open heart surgery is what, what yeah. you experience. Yeah. And it's not, I just think what you're articulating so well indirectly is that to, to forgive from the depths of our heart, we can forgive so much on our own, mm. but to get the rest of it, to get that last 5%, to get the, to scrape the bottom, to clean, and not only to, to yeah. empty it, to, to clean it, yeah. to, to restore it, God has to be an instrumental part of that. And, it, and you don't need, you know, you received a very special grace through our time together. Um, but, but anybody who, who might be watching this or listening to this, all you need to do is just invoke the Holy Spirit and invite God in to go into that part and to reveal it or to mm. clean it or to heal it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. There, it, it's interesting as we're talking about this, are, are you, you're familiar with Unbound oh, yeah. method of prayer. Oh yeah. They have five. How do people find that book? Just just share the, the, the name of the Unbound uh, Neil, book. Neil Lozano, yeah. uh, author of Unbound, but it's, it's just a fantastic book. My, my wife and I for years have done Unbound prayer with people. And, but what's, what's interesting is they refer to them as keys. Okay. Keys that unlock, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you work your way through these five keys. The first is repentance. Ooh. And you, yeah. you, you can kind of struggle intellectually a little bit with like, wait a second, I'm, trying, I'm trying to yourself. pray for something where I've been wounded. Yeah. You, and you want me to start with repentance? The second key yeah. is forgiveness. Yes. So you start with repentance. Your then, personal repentance. Then you forgive, personal then you renounce then the, forgiveness. the hold that these spirits or these events or these traumas or things have, have had on you. So I don't, I don't know, like, but the keys are meant to unlock graces 
uh, and, which is just really, really powerful. That's awesome. It's, it's always there, but it's like we're, we're, we're keeping it at arm's length. Unless well, we and like, like you're saying, like pulling the drainage plug out, you know, uh, where you're holding on. It's just a little, little bit, right? Yeah. But the, the, the forgiveness is the complete releasing of these things. Mm. But before you move on to another okay, scripture yeah, passage, yeah. though, because I, 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 as you read the scripture, like my mind got stuck on something other than with your whole heart. Oh, go. <laughs> so what, what did the Lord say? Flexio Divina, come yeah, to life. Yes, really what did the Lord say to you? <laughs> So it, it just struck me that part of the disturbing aspect to this scripture is uh, the what was what was the was it a king who who was yeah, it? yeah the master the, Ma the, the master, master is forgiving a much greater debt yeah. yeah and then he finds another you know fellow servant who owes him a fraction of what he himself owed and. Like that, like the other servants around him were disturbed, right? Yes. Like you, you, you had this huge, huge debt yeah. Uh, yeah. eliminated, like just forgiven. Yeah. And, in and then you terms. turn around and throttle the neck of your fellow servant, yeah. yes. demanding that he pay this back, you know, this much, much smaller sum. I, I think at the heart of forgiveness, actually, is this understanding that we're broken our lives without God are a complete train wreck. And every single one of us owes a debt that we could never repay. Yes. Right. And right, many of us have lost sight of our tr the true state of our condition, right? Yes. In, in a way that I could be angry at somebody else yep. when God has forgiven me. Do you see this? Yes. I, I, I think it's ironic. I, I know when other people see this, it's not going to be today. Yeah. But the gospel reading for Mass today was... How, how could you notice the splinter in your brother's <laughs> eye yeah. and miss the log in yeah. your own eye? Yeah. Like the, this is, I don't know, it's just the heart of our Christian faith is, look, understand the true state of things. You are in a heap of debt and God has forgiven it all. Thank you, Lord. Right? Thank you, Lord. That's, that's what motivates our forgiveness. Seriously, right? this is, that, that, that uh, is the precondition for entering any relationship with humility and, and, and being able to forgive. This ties in perfectly to this next scripture and, um, and perfectly to the cross you're wearing at all times as a reminder. Yeah. This is in Matthew chapter six. After the Lord teaches us the Our Father, which we say all the time, and we, we don't take it that seriously when we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or I like the translation better, forgive us our debts yeah. as we forgive our debtors. And then Jesus drives that point home that we often overlook. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So to come before God first and foremost and say, I, I did that. Yeah. And you forgave me from the cross. Yeah. How the heck can I really stand before that and contemplate that yeah. and not forgive? Mm. Well, and, and I think this is what I was starting to say about the first key of Unbound. Why would you start with repentance? Yeah. Uh, when I pray with people in Unbound ministry, and a lot of times we're praying with people like you said, Father, with just deep, deep, really traumatic things or really, really hurt. And 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 so, you, I don't know, sometimes it just feels so awkward. Like you're, you're praying with somebody who's been abused or molested or raped or, you know, so any of these kinds of things. And, and you say, okay, I want you to repent. Yep. But that's a hard thing to sell almost. It, like in that moment, you're just like, wow. But the way that I explain it is what happens to us in woundedness is self-protection. So the reason why we start with repentance is because when if you've hurt me, like my natural reaction is this. I turn away from you, Right. Repentance is turning back. So there, there can't be any healing that begins to happen unless I actually have the, the, the posture shift, wow. right? And, and so I'll, I'll explain to people, sometimes deeply wounded people, the reason why we start with this key is because you need to turn back and face the Lord. Wow. Like in, in ways that you've been hurt, in ways that you've been wounded, you, you've turned away from him just to protect yourself. You're actually protecting your vital organs. Wow. It's a normal human response. 
But the Lord needs to see you. He needs to look in your eyes. He needs to minister love to you. And he can't do that if you're turned the other direction. Mm. So we start with this repentance because you, you want to repent for any way that I've closed off my heart, for any way that I've allowed this hurt to cause me to turn away from you. Yeah. Help me, help me make this turn of repentance, right? Mm. Well, and that can be a great starter for a, a prayer conversation with our Lord is if you're struggling with forgiving someone who's hurt you deeply, you can use that as a jump off point saying, Lord, looking at the cross, right? Lord, this is what I've done to you. How, how did you forgive me? Mm. And now this person or these people have hurt or betrayed me. May I have that grace? Mm. May I have those words? Yeah. May I have mm. what I need to imitate you versus the world? Thanks for saying that. The, the, the Christian life is, isn't about following some principles. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we gotta always bring this back to, yes. help me be like you, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Give me that power well, to be well, like you. Well, it's almost like the repentance, like this yes. turning is acknowledging, I actually don't have what I need to forgive. Right. Mm -hmm. we're, so we're the, re the reason why that's the first key is like, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta acknowledge my own state well, of things yeah. and my own need. And then because of that grace, now I can forgive, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's powerful. And the Fathers of Mercy, you have a very large cross, I've noticed. <laughs> the Mission Cross. You don't go I swimming with that. No, no, we do not swim. <laughs> I'm going to start swim. wearing my Jim cross, is, too. Jim is, uh, Jim's going to be the auxiliary of the, uh, the, the auxiliary I'm Fathers. I'm joining the Mercy. order tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to get him a badge as well. So right. that's, uh, well, that's just as a constant reminder, right? It, it is, it is. So, so it's uh, the Fathers of Mercy were founded in 1808 in the yeah. aftermath of the original French Revolution in the 1789. And... Uh, our founder, Father Razan, was asked to establish a community to leave the parish the diocesan setting, to re-evangelize France, to heal a nation that was wounded by a revolution, mm. by Marxist ideologies, by the destruction and tearing down of institutions. And Father Razan, as he prayed, and, and there's a long story of how all of this came about, but he chose one word as the healing antidote to all of France's problems, and it's God's mercy. Oh. Wow. Because on our own, wow. all of the natural things, all of the best legal advice, all of the best arbiters, all of those things will not reach the resolution mm. that mankind needs to heal. Mm. I mean, one of the things in the French Revolution is that Christians, Catholics were exiled, properties were confiscated, sold by the state to another person. So now you might be the legal owner of my family ancestral heritage. Wow. And now that it's all settled and done, we're both legal owners of the same piece of property. And you're living in my so house. So now what? So now what? Oh my God. How do, and, and so, and, wow. and, then, and then maybe your friends killed my children. Now what? Mm. And so, so, Part of the missionary cross, you know, we have the badge of the image and the father, father of the prodigal son. And then we wear the mission cross and it's the preaching cross. And so it's, it's mm. to use to, re, you know, to preach Christ crucified, right? But for me personally, um, I, I love wearing this when I preach because I'm constantly touching it and I'm constantly using it. And it tempers my preaching because it reminds me that I did this. Mm. This right here, when I look at the cross, that's on me. I did that. And so when I preach, when I engage, when I meet someone, it doesn't matter if they're an atheistic Marxist or a Christian who wants to be better. It doesn't matter who I'm with. I just recognize that I'm no different than them in many ways. I need God's mercy as much as anybody else. The, the, uh, it is, and the, the mission of the Fathers of Mercy Talk about relevant for 2022 in the United States. Um, and this, this scripture comes to mind too, as from Matthew 24, 12 through 13. Because of law, the, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Yes. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So he, he's tying whether or not our love grows cold to whether or not we're gonna, gonna make it. Right. And, and it's easy, it's a lack of forgiveness, a lack of mercy, when you see legitimate lawlessness. Like yes. I'm really hurt by things that happened. Yes. People recovering from the French Revolution, they saw the, the, the legitimate injustice that happened. 
the debts that were owed to them, yes. spiritual and, and material. So they're left real cold. And then society is destroyed by non-forgiveness. And we see it happen now. Pe- people reaching back a uh, hundred years, 150 years to say uh, the United States is not, is, it has nothing redeemable about it. Burn the whole thing down. The, whole thing. The, the entire history is summed up by nothing but the worst element of it. Let's fixate on that. And, right. and, and, and then if you, you bring that, that up as a problem, people say, well, you're not sympathetic. That's what the communists did. Yes. I mean, it was all about that's what fraternity, liberty, uh, equ- equity. That's what the French revolutionaries did, yeah. and and there was blood everywhere, uh, and and not that things don't have to be set right when there's injustice, but when it's done with the spirit of vengeance. Yes. How do we temper these things? How do you how do you really fix injustice while at the same time having a spirit of mercy and forgiveness? And that, that's what you guys help rebuild France with. How do we build the United States right now? Well, it comes back to these principles, yeah. right? You know, it, what ethos do we adhere to? Mm. And in the, uh, you know, Sheriff David Clark, he said that he had to deal with the racism and the anger and and the absolute just, just yeah. tremendous pressure on him as an African-American. And he said the day that he forgave America was the day that he was set free. Wow. He, he said, I forgave, I chose to forgive the failings of whoever they were and all of the racist wow. incidents that he incurred himself. He made a decision to forgive. You know, and when, and when we have a culture of forgiveness, it creates freedom to move forward. We don't say what happened in the past was okay. We, now we look forward and say, how can we improve right. and build upon the good that we have? And the accusation would be, you're saying it's okay. You're saying you don't have to set things right. And it's like, isn't it amazing that, that the simple message of you have to forgive from your heart is actually as radical today as it was when Jesus was talking to the Jews when the Romans yeah. were dominating their culture. Right. And they were facing real pain and real injustice, and we faced real pain and injustice from people in our lives. Yeah. And this is a, this is an upsetting message. Yes, but there's no well, peace it, without it's, it. It's like the contradiction of everything media, like all of the messages in movies and movies and yeah. things in in our world, is all about vengeance and retribution. Yep. And that's right? moral in, in like their almost, eyes like now. Almost, almost, that's every, like a moral every high ground movie, to be angry. At. Every action movie that's ever been made almost always is kind of rooted in that storyline. You know, some great injustice done, and and now that gives you license to go and do whatever you need to do to to you know act out retribution for what's been done to you. You you asked a question, Chris, about like how how do we address these. Uh, things in, in going on in society. I don't know. I, I just am bit, I'm a big believer in like you, you were kind of alluding to this with the stuff that happened in France. It's one person at a time. Yeah. Right. Yes. Like, yes. Like how, how do we change society? Well, cha- change my kid, change my wife, change me, uh, help, help change my neighbors, help, you know, where, wherever I am, if I can be a source of this authentic love which is free, yeah. it's forgiving, it's, yeah. you know, um, like that's going to spread, yeah. right? Well, well in, in we, as you say that, it's like one person at a time, like, oh, geez, you know, that's, that's, that sure is a lot. Well, if it's, if it's only three people going after one person at a time, but it's like, this is the beautiful thing about this message for this audience, is that the forgiveness exercise we're gonna do at the end of this. Yeah. They don't need to take this video and, and give it to a person. They can lead them through, lead another person through it themselves. It's mm, it's beautiful. it's the story of the matches, right? Yeah. We light a match, and then we reach out, and other people's light their matches, and there was an exponential growth. Yeah. And this is how the spread of Christianity beautiful. happened. It was it was discipling one another, one at a time, man. one at a time. Where, where does that so, that thing be, better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? Mm, yeah. Who said that? I did. I made that up. You made that's a Christophanic line. That's a Stephanic. But because that's that's it right there. Like yeah. look at John Paul II. And what he did over the course right. of his life, the oh, fall of and communism. Well, and yeah. talk about having to forgive. Yeah, like, like, like a man he, who watched his own like family. He, he's and the friends. personification of this because yeah. he actually did it just the Polish people, literally have a right one to be person resentful. at a time. Yes, he 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 just yeah. everywhere he went and every person that he was in contact with, he preached a civilization of love, mercy, right. forgiveness, 
and it became a movement. It became, you know, and then obviously he's elevated into more and more influential positions where that message has a wider reach. And next thing you know, like he's organizing these huge worker, uh, late labor uh, movement things yes. where th literally thousands and thousands of people solidarity are, movement. are coming yes. together in solidarity. And the, the communist leaders don't know what to do with this, Yes. right? Uh, they're looking for violence and they're looking for something to arrest and looking, you know, and there's not, they can't, they're just standing there peacefully singing praying songs rosary, and praying so. the rosary. And that's the uh, perfect example because some people might hear what we were saying a couple minutes ago and think, well, you're saying not to act in injustice. No, John Paul II acted, but the starting point was from a place of, I'm not dominated by what you've done because I've forgiven in my heart and I can think clearly about how to deal with this stuff because I'm not driven by the insanity of unforgiveness, which works into a fevered pitch where there's guillotines in the street in the French Revolution, where, where the Germans who were crushed by the Treaty of Versailles uh, and they were impoverished, they were treated horribly. And then all of a sudden they become Nazis because I have a justice thing, I'm owed. Uh, solidarity movement. It's powerful. It, it, it actually worked. Yep. It actually worked at overcoming injustice. But this is this is hard because we don't always feel like it, which brings me to the next scripture. In fact, we usually we usually don't feel like it. Uh, this is from Matthew 18. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? <laughs> I wonder if he had someone in mind. He's like, that guy, seven <laughs> times he messed up. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. And I, 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 what struck me, again, Lexia Divina, you're like, which is, means divine reading for those who don't know, this is, this is what the monks called it. Like, that you're not just studying, it's not theology, it's, it's letting God speak to you. What jumped out at me was what Peter said. You don't ask this question unless you really don't feel like forgiving. <laughs> His starting point was, how often do I have to do this? I don't want to. Yep. There's gotta be a limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's gotta be a top number. How do you do it when you don't want to? Uh, I, one of the and things, can you really do it from the heart when you don't feel like it? Well, I, I think as Jim said earlier, there are stages, right? There are yeah. levels of this. Yeah. And, and the first stage is, is going back to the Our Father. That is, a, that is a, a, a legal phraseology in the Our Father. Forgive us as mm -hmm. we forgive each other. So, so we're putting a legal clause upon ourselves when we pray the Our Father. Dang. We will only be forgiven to the degree that we are willing to forgive another person, which mm. is what our Lord said in Matthew 6. So, so you think of it in illegal terms, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if I owed you money and I wasn't paying you, you could yeah. go to a judge and say, Judge, Father Geraci's not paying me, here is the evidence. Judge will look at it and says, yes, he owes you $10,000. And uh, you can, the judge says, what do you want me to do? Have him arrested, garnished, judge? Let it go. I want you to render a judgment that Father Dracy doesn't owe me a dime. It's not gonna feel good. Yeah, no, no, not at all. Yeah, yeah. But when you make that choice and the judge renders that judgment that I am free of the debt that I owe you, because I wasn't paying you anyhow, there was no contrition in my heart, there was nothing, there was no movement. All I was doing is occupying real estate in your brain and emotions and whatever toxicity causing in your life. Mm. And when you say, I choose to forgive, render that judgment, it's an eviction notice, and you say, Geraci's out, Holy Spirit's in. Eviction mm. notice. It's an yeah, eviction like notice. It. I'm giving someone who doesn't even like me real estate in my head, why yes. do I do that? Yes, yeah. and so when you choose to forgive, you make that legal decision to forgive, you now, and because judges are gonna be like, that's a lot of money to forgive. Mm. Are you sure? He's like, listen, I'm gonna to have to depend on God for everything else because of the wound that this has caused. But I'm fine with that. Mm. Because my God is bigger Amen. than that wound, Amen. than that debt. And so make, so it starts, so we're, how do we begin? How do we, we it, it, you know, because it's not about the feeling, it's about choosing to forgive. At the end of our life, we may not have forgiven truly from the depths of our heart, but even when you make that choice to make that legal decision, you can choose to do that from the depths of the heart. This, this is going back to that being present, being present to ourself, acknowledging what took place, the wounds, all of it. So literally saying it, even if you're not Just feeling it. Just saying it, it's not, it's not about a feeling. Yeah. Oh, there's so many, I, well, I think Jim can speak to 
not feeling. Tell us about yourself. Well, but the, but the feelings story. follow right, in time, right? In right? right? And in sometimes time, they can take right? a long, long time. <laughs> in time. And I've got what an amazing thing it is, uh, right? Like, like I, I've had numerous experiences in my life where it, forgiveness has had to be a decision. And, it's, and sometimes it's taken a long, long time. But what a beautiful thing when the person that you had unforgiveness towards, you run into them. And the first reaction in you is not to think of the resentment, but to actually be excited to see them. Mm. Wow. Like when that's that, only God. That's when that circle. shift happens yeah. in your heart mm -hmm. after, you know, yeah. long time of choosing to forgive and asking for the grace to forgive, and then you run into the person and, and bam, you're like, I've actually really forgiven them from the heart. Wow. There was literally nothing left in there yeah. that was stirring that up in me. Crazy. When, when, when I hear this scripture passage, I want to go back to another experience in my life. Uh, I was involved in the Columbine shooting year, years ago. Yeah. Uh, we were in the parish right down the street. I was the youth minister. Three of our kids were murdered uh, in, in the shooting. A, a number of others, you know, physically injured. And I mean, it, for, for the next 18 to 24 months, it just became my whole life was ministering in that community and trying to minister to people in, in the wake of that tragedy. Well, very early on, like in the, in the first week, like we were holding these adoration nights and prayer nights and uh, we, we just, we didn't know what to do. So we just invited everybody, we'll just come to church and we'll pray. Uh, well, in one of those nights, I, uh, Father Ken, the pastor at the parish at, at the time, invited me to come up and say something at the end of the night. And what had been moving me in prayer, this was probably, you know, sometime almost a week after the shooting, and we were just getting into all of the funeral services. And that, but this one night, you know, there, there was, you know, over a thousand people probably gathered together. And I was just supposed to give this closing. And what moved in me was the need to forgive. Because what you heard around the church, you know, was all of this incredible grief over the loss, mm. but then this visceral anger mm. and almost hatred for the two shooters. Mm. And I had been praying early that morning and something that was just moving in my heart was, uh, you, you can't move towards any real healing here holding on to that. Wow. So you, 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 you must forgive, you, you have to forgive. And, and the thing that surged in me that morning was this little threefold mantra. I don't know how else to describe it, but I, the words that I heard from the Holy Spirit that morning were, we survived, we will prevail, we have hope to carry on. So when Father Ken invited me up to talk, I started with those words. I, d I just said, this is what the Lord said to me this morning in my prayer. And I said, you, you can't get to this without forgiving. Mm. And I, I want to invite us as a community, we have to choose to forgive. You're not going to feel like it, like we've been talking about. You're not going to feel like forgiving Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold right now. Right. But we have to choose to forgive them. Mm. Well, unfortunately, there was a news station standing in the back of the church filming that. That got on the evening news. And over the next week, we just got, you know, hammered, hammered yeah. Yeah. with negative media, negative yeah. press, and people showing up. Because in the you church. asked for the people to forgive. Eric and bomb, and bomb threats. And this is a radical message. You know, this is it's uh, it's so unbelievable. But I so love it, that it, you've it, named them. Yeah. Like, so it, 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 I, I, which I was not expecting, obviously. Yeah, like true. I had no idea that there, there would be this backlash. You know, um, but what was really powerful is the teenagers. So all of the adults are fighting now yeah. and wow. angry and you got, you know, news stations showing up and wanting to do press conferences and, uh, you know, like you're, you're the, you're the people that said on the evening news that you got to forgive these two boys. And yeah. it, it was, and it became monsters, a little, it yes. became a little bit of a mess. Right. Yeah. But what was beautiful is a couple of teenagers over the next week, as all of this was going on in the limelight yeah. off to the side, made a t-shirt out of we survived, we will prevail, mm. we have hope to carry on. Mm, nice. They made an artistic 
you know, picture of that. And so on the, that's on the front of the church shirt. On the back of the shirt, they put a, a, a box, 70 times 7, with the message of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Over the next three, four months, we literally printed thousands and thousands of those T-shirts. And the teenagers Praise at the God. parish gave them away to yeah. all of the students, not only at Columbine High School, but at Chatfield High School yeah. and in the community. And it, it became the rally cry yeah. of through forgiveness, yeah. right? Through forgiveness, we're yeah. going we're gonna to get to this place where we have hope to carry on. But Praise just, the Lord. But that, so... Thank you for that witness. I mean, it's radical and thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, yeah. But what you're, I mean, the whole, the, the woundedness that Eric and Dylan caused, the community, the world, the society as a whole, it, it, the ripple effects. Right. But 70 times seven, our forgiveness will, God's grace is bigger than the evil they committed. Amen. And this isn't just about the person needing that forgiveness or deserving it in any way no. or doing something to them. This is about us being liberated, yes. uh, which brings me to this next one. This is, these are the words of Jesus from the cross. This is from yeah. Luke 23, 33 to 34. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's Jesus forgiving people who, not, not, not only were they not sorry, they don't even know what they're doing. They're not even at the place where they are conscious of the fact that they, they should wrong. maybe <laughs> say, I'm sorry. Right. And <laughs> how do we do that? Because half the time we go through life, there's, there's people who are sometimes genu genuinely giving themselves over to wickedness and they want to hurt us. How do you forgive when, when the person's not sorry because they're either not aware or because they, they're happy that they hurt you? He, he just showed us. You just do it. Or why I mean, should that, we? Is that even possible? I mean, Everyone what a powerful thinks, testimony, right? So many well, people I, think you have to hear the words, I'm sorry, to say I forgive you. Well, there, there, there's a beautiful theological principle in, the, in our faith. We, we call it unilateral forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness. Which is one way. Right. So I'm j just like Jesus is. They're, they're not standing at the foot of the cross saying, I'm so sorry that we did this to you. Mm -hmm. um, but he knows mm -hmm. that, number one, holding on to any of that for himself is just going to be attachment for him that holds him down. But it also holds them bound. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So part, part of him with the unilateral forgiveness is making this decision that I'm, I'm relieving all debt owed to me. Mm -hmm. Like there's been a violation of justice here. Like what was due to me was deprived or, or, or even worse, something was perpetrated on me that was not deserved. I'm releasing all debt owed to me here because I know it's best for me, but I also know that it's best for the one who hurt me. Um, so I, I don't know, I've had numerous examples of this in my own journey where you, you've had things that have happened and things that people did to you and you, you maybe tried to talk with them. You tried to see if you could get to some level of understanding that they would understand how hurtful what they did to you was and you just can't get there. At a, at a certain point, you just have to come to the, the realization, I'm not going to get what I need here. And actually, mm -hmm. I don't need anything mm. except God, right? Like, Amen. like except you, you know, um, I, I had a I had a beautiful experience with this over the, over the past year, just going through some difficult things in my own life. And right before Easter, on uh, the the Friday before um, Passion Palm Sunday, uh, was on a retreat, and we're we're looking at the scripture passage of. Uh, Jesus healing the blind man as he's leaving the city of Jericho. Mm -hmm. We're like, what a powerful verse that is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jer the the blind man's crying out. You know, Bar it, Bar Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, right? So he's crying out. You know, Jesus, Son of David, have pity on me. And there's this beautiful encounter moment that happens, where Jesus says, "Call him, bring bring him to me." Mm -hmm. 
So they bring the blind man, and what is, Jesus says to him, the first thing he says to him is like, what do you, what do you want me to do for you? Mm. Like that, what a powerful prompt that is, mm. right? Um, but, and what does Bartimaeus say? Well, it's obvious. I, I, I want to see. Yeah. I want to yeah. see. Yeah. So I'm on this retreat. I'm praying with the scripture, and Jesus says to me, Jim, what do you want to see? And I'm like, there's not enough time or a long enough piece of paper for me to write everything down that I want to see right now. I want this to be fixed and I want this to be fixed and I want to know why this happened and I want to know why this person was able to do this to me. Like I, I have a long, long list of what I want to see. And, and then in this moment, Jesus just said, just see me. And I, and I realized when Jesus healed Bartimaeus, what did he see? Jesus. Jesus. Right. Like he saw what was right in front of him. Mm. This is about us and God. So th th this yeah. whole, this, this whole unilateral forgiveness, like the power of it is acknowledging I, I don't need anything. All of these think that I, things that I think I need, when I see Christ, I'm not going to need, none of those are going to matter anymore. Right? If, if, I, if I just see him, all of the yeah. other stuff washes yeah. away. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah, and one of the fruits of forgiveness is is reconciliation, right? right. But but that that isn't necessarily the primary goal of forgiveness. Right. It, and that's a fruit that can only happen if the person is sorry and things are worked out. And, so, and if they're not, I can still claim that fruit of forgiveness that I'm free. Right. That I'm that I'm coming closer to Jesus. That I'm living the life I, I was born to live, right. and not you know it's it's not about I'm not going to let you do that to me. It's it's about I'm not going to let you take my love away yeah, and my yeah, joy. The real estate and my, I love that and the real estate that. in my head. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, God, go ahead. Can I take us to the yes, Passion please, of the Christ? So please. so in the movie The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson mm -hmm. took some really amazing artistic license. Yeah. yeah. So when they're nailing Jesus' feet to the cross, yeah. as the hammer is coming down. Jesus is crying out, Abba, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. And so Gibson, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives us the language to forgive in the midst of being hurt, mm. in the midst of a bad relationship. And I'm not talking about physical abuse where you need to remove yourself. You don't, you don't I'm, I'm talking about the, the hurts of life, mm. spousal relationships, right? Um, family relationships, children, work relationships, right? In the midst of the nails being put through their, his body, he has Christ saying, Father, forgive them. So we can, we can clear the deck as it's happening. Clear the deck. Yeah. Right then and there. Right then and there. It's, it's, if we have that disposition and practice of forgiving, yes. we never have to take it, not even for a right. minute. It's like, boom. In a, it's oh, it's got to become powerful. muscle memory. It has to become muscle memory. Yeah, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a waxed uh, car, man. Yeah. The rain just poof, keeps right going off. off. I, got, I got two more I want to dive into. Uh, this one is from Mark chapter 5, verse 40. Okay, so Jesus was going to, to heal a child who, who was dead. And when he said, well, the kid's not dead, but asleep. I'm going to go pray over this kid. Wake the kid up. Well, the crowd's response is that in Mark 40 here, uh, Mark 5, 40, they laughed at him. Now, Jesus' response was, was really not nice. It wasn't very Jesus-like, as a lot of people like to paint Jesus as, the, you know, just nice. I'm sorry. He put them all. <laughs> I'm like, we're gonna, I'm yeah, working right. on being sarcastic. Yeah, right. sarcastic. No right. sarcastic. No sarcasm. Like, what would Jesus do? Read the Bible. You'll right. see what he would do. <laughs> but he put them outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. And then he went in where the child was. I love this. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise, which was really an endearing term the way the, in the Aramaic that he said to her, like my, my little precious one. Um, but I love this. He put them outside. So here, here's a Lord who in the moment would, would forgive things, right? right? And yet had boundaries. And I think a lot of people are hesitant to forgive because they wrongly perceive that, that mandate to forgive as, well, let's pretend everything's fine. Come on over, let's have a beer. Yeah. Um, and, and forgiving and forgetting, forgetting have to come together as if I'm supposed to pretend that you're a safe person for me. Like, let's say you're physically abused by some, like the, the Lord is, is not asking us to not have proper boundaries. So how do we, how do you, how do you forgive and push out? That's, that's hard for a guy like me because I internalize other people's emotions a lot, just the way I'm hardwired. 
And, the, and, and my, my first thought is, well, they're not going to feel forgiven if it's like you're over there. Or in my heart even saying, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're in my life still, but you're, you're at the front door for a while. How do we do this? How do we balance this? For me, it comes back to that presence. Mm -hmm. Being present to the reality of what has happened and taking counsel with someone, if, specifically if it's a big thing, so that to make sure that you're seeing it clearly. You're not seeing it through your own lens, but you're seeing through a very healthy lens and recognizing the wound or the hurt that you endured. And sometimes in those relationships, boundaries need to be established. Yeah. Because a lot of times people will say, I don't feel like I have forgiven a person. Well, we liken that to someone, if I, you know, if I came over here and kicked you in the shin, um, you can forgive me for kicking you in the shin and we can be reconciled. But I'm gonna put my leg back here. But you're, well, you can <laughs> put your leg back there, but you're also gonna hurt for yeah. a few days. Right. So, so not only will, your, will you hurt for a few days, every time we come around and if you see me in that space that I was when I kicked you, there's gonna be an apprehension there. And that's, that's healthy caution. Mm. And so we have to recognize, and again, I don't wanna dive into the psychology of this, but we recognize uh, the emotional boundaries, physical boundaries, and then also spiritual boundaries. And so- What does that mean? What's a spiritual so boundary? So a spiritual boundary, um, I, I liken it to a person who engages in spiritual manipulation. Right? Hmm. Chris, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. To tell you to give me 10 bucks right now. It was actually 200. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but, but I mean, but it's, it's the spiritual manipulation, right? And that's, yeah. that's the easiest term, right? And there's a variety of, of forms of that. I worked with a girl who, uh, who a, um, uh, the guy kept saying, the Holy Spirit, keep, keep on putting on my heart that you're gonna be my wife. And then he like turned out to be this deadbeat and like, yeah. and, and, like but yeah. she, she heard that and believed that, right? Wow, wow. So, so boundaries, right? So how do we have emotional boundaries, spiritual boundaries, physical boundaries even, mm. you know? And, and then, but, but being, coming back to that presence, do I see the situation for what it is? Do I have an objective third party to help me balance that? And then also, am I praying through this? Lord, what are you inviting me to do in this particular relationship? Boundaries, more, less? Right? Yeah. What do you, and because sometimes we may need large boundaries mm -hmm. to allow the healing process to take place, but then there may come a point where God says, now it's time to reconcile. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to earn back a brother through forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That deeper reconciliation, that fulfillment of that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And this is where healthy boundaries actually make a lot of sense. Like, yeah, if somebody's really hurt you or wounded you in some way, yeah, being around that person all of the time. Yeah. is not a healthy, good thing for you. Yeah, so and, and it's okay choosing to, to set a good that. Yeah, so it's... I, 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 I have some childhood wounds that, that didn't give me permission to recognize that, that, that um, in my adulthood, I almost have to say to that, that child within yes. me that, Chris, it's okay. It's okay to push this person out, to create a boundary that's healthy with that person. Um, and when I don't do that, I, I, I end up... I end up letting, letting people walk all over me in a way that, that I'm quiet and then I'm resentful of them and half the time they're like, dude, what's, what's the matter, man? Just say no. But you know, there's a, it's all tied in to the forgiveness and the psychology and the spirituality of it. And, and I want to bring it back around to having that third party, whether it's a priest, a religious, a competent authority to help you when you have to establish big boundaries, yeah. bigger things, make sure you're not operating out of a point of self-reference mm. that, that yeah, I cool. feel this way, and yeah. therefore, because sometimes can't see straight. You can't see straight, and uh, you know it's like I deal with this in in some of the the marital work is that one of the spouses feels their experience of this because there's so much other hurt yeah. that this one particular hurt is so much bigger than it is, mm -hmm. and we have to put things in proper context when we establish those things. So having someone who can it's a beautiful saying: your head is like a bad neighborhood. Don't go in there alone. <laughs> um, this. <laughs> Especially with sticky stuff like this. Yeah. Uh, let's land on this one. This is really powerful, and, and I, it gives us a lens into, into the experience of, forgive, of forgiving. Uh, this is from Genesis 50. And Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Yeah. And became a, he was thrown into a cistern and became a slave, and then you know, saved an empire and, and saved his family in the end. Right. So you can see by the end of the story the hand of God orchestrating it all and allowing bad, didn't cause, but God allowed bad things to happen because that was taken up into his, into his story, into his symphony. I, or I love in the, in the Silmarillion from J.R.R. Tolkien that, that the, the dark angel tried to make his own song and, and that the creator was so powerful, he didn't destroy the song, but he widened his symphony. 
to fit the, and, and every time he tried to make his new song, the creator would widen his symphony even more. Mm-hmm. Wow. That, that's the power that's of God. The power that's of God. the power of, of the cross redemption. The whole, the whole Bible is that. Uh, but Joseph's response when his, his brothers are before him and he could, he could throw these guys in jail. He could have them executed. This is it, man. And they're, and they're terrified and they needed food. <laughs> so they said, behold, we're your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Mm. Praise God. Uh, As as people are dealing with these kinds of things, like I I would, I don't know if if you're familiar with this book, but I would just recommend it to anybody that's struggling with something going on in their life. Uh, Trustful surrender to divine providence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, Uh, that's a class. uh, Father uh, Claude de Colombier and Brother Lawrence. I Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of those spiritual classics. But the, the, the whole driving premise of the book is everything is the express will of God. Mm. Everything that happens to us, even hard things, even traumatic things, mm. it, it, Satan wouldn't have the ability to do anything, even if it's actually done by him. He, he wouldn't have the power to do anything had God not given him yeah. the power, right? So first of all, that's a hard pill to swallow. Like when it you is. start reading and those couple opening this, chapters, yeah. you're just like, oh, okay, wow, you, that's kind of really hard to accept. And you share in our, our fearless program, you, and, and in interviews I've done with you, you're, you've survived childhood sex abuse. And I wanted to say that because some people might be hearing you thinking, you don't know what I've been through, Jim. And you've been through a lot of stuff yeah. as a guy who's saying that. Right. And, and I, I, like I, I went through some really difficult things over the past several years. And in the midst of them, Lots of frustration, lots of anger even, and resentment and confusion. But reading that book again, which is probably the third time in my life that I've, I've read it, I'm brought back to this. Like there, there's one chapter where he talks about, you know, how, how can you look at this incredible misfortune that has come into your life and think that this is somehow good or something that God would want? But the crushing misfortune actually leads to things happening in you that your normal pious activities could have never gotten you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and and, and he literally says, it's almost as if God had to put you under anesthesia and put you on an operating table in order to do what he needed to do. And he used this crushing misfortune in your life to accomplish it. (laughs) Like, I have experienced this amazing healing over the last two or three years in my life. And the circumstances of my life, painful as they may be, were actually providential. They, they, and it's all connected actually to my childhood abuse issues and, and the ongoing healing with that. Like it's all intertwined and interconnected in that psychological area. But how, how beautiful is that? And, and, and I, I, I don't know, this is probably the driving theme of this whole conversation is just keep coming back to this realization that really the true state of things is God is my loving father. He actually wills that what is best for me, mm. even when the things that I'm experiencing are very difficult and mm. very hard. Yeah. You know? um, and if I can have a posture and a receptive heart to whatever happens, and be forgiving and be loving and be uh, generous even in, in my response to those things, there, there's just no stopping the power of God through us, right? Like it... Uh, what, what a, this, is, this is what Paul said, you're more than a conqueror. Yeah. I look at what she went through, oh, I see you sitting yeah, there, that's the I see more than a conqueror. Yeah. I, I see Joseph who was so badly treated. And it's like, you know, I'm just brushing off what you did even though it was horrible. You threw me into a, a, a freaking cistern, dude. Yeah. What you willed for evil, God willed yeah. for good. Not, not that God possessed you to do evil to yeah. me, but he allowed it well, intentionally. And, yeah, and now let me so give you some food and actually feed the whole yeah. nation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm part of a bigger story than the story of my abuser. Yeah. And there's, there's, wow. there's beautiful things I see in you. I see in my wife who's survived childhood sex abuse. And I, and I often ask this question when I'm interviewing somebody who's been through trauma. What do you love about yourself that stemmed directly from what you suffered? And uh, I'd, I'd ask people who are listening to this, just, uh, we're not gonna, we don't have to go on all that right now, but 
think about the parts of you that are strong and the things that happened not not to you but for you, right? But that, is that shift of perspective to gratitude for my life and trust in my Father that makes forgiveness easier. Yeah. Doesn't make things less painful. The one of the images that we, I was given in seminary was uh, if you have the beautiful, most beautiful stained glass window and someone comes in and just wrecks it, just mm -hmm. takes it to the ground and destroys it. Mm -hmm. God doesn't come in to pick up the pieces to rebuild the window that was there. He's gonna pick up the pieces and make something more beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, what you just said, I... I, I I'm part of God's story, not the story of an abuser. Yes, story, yes, yeah. so I'm part of God's story, not... So, so in anyone's case, I'm part of God's story, not the story of, of my woundedness, mm -hmm. my brokenness, wow. the evil that's happened to me. My, and we, but we have the choice. Mm -hmm. We have the choice to be part of God's story or to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And how do we cling to it? Um, Conrad Bars is a great psychologist. Uh, and anyone who studies psychology should study Conrad Bars. He's okay. a Catholic guy. Uh, Father Brian Malady just wrote a book, How um, St. Thomas Saved Psychology. And, uh, wow. and he's referencing wow. bars because bars goes back and introduces virtue as a virtue of a path to healing. And mm. Conrad Bars was in the concentration camp during World War II. Wow. And when he and another guy, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing the story, I may not get it all exactly yeah, yeah, right, yeah. but as they come out of the concentration camp, the one guy says to Conrad Bars, this is the greatest day of my life being released. Mm. And Bars says to his friend, well, if you're saying that this is the greatest day of your life being released, then it should be more appropriate to say the greatest day of your life was when you weren't incarcerated. Wow. Because the day that you were incarcerated brought you to this day. And when we see it through the, day. when we see it through the American lens, when we see it through the natural lens, wow. the day of my release was the greatest day of my life. Wow. But when we see it through the Joseph lens, when we through, see it through the story of God, then the greatest day was the day of my incarceration because that leads to the resurrection. Well, there's a, a reason we call it Good Friday, not Bad Friday. Well, there, there's a beautiful principle in all of this that, because most of us are focusing on the end. We want to get to heaven. We want to get to the prize. We want to get to the finish line, we want to go through the death. right? Which that was another reading from today. Paul's talking about, you know, running the race and run, run so as to win. But I, I, I don't know. I think there's a fundamental truth to our faith that God's in, intimate. He's very interested in us in getting to the finish line, right? That's, that's the aim. But he's intimately interested in the path that we take to get there. He actually wants to be with us on the path. He wants to comfort us and console us and reassure us and Presence. nurture us. So like he's actually with us on the run and, all, or, and sometimes walking, uh, but he's actually on the path and is intimately interested in every aspect of getting to the end. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. His love transforms everything. It gives us that power to be truly free through forgiveness. This has been one of the most uh, amazing conversations I've ever had. So thanks for having it with me. Praise God. You're gonna, now, in the last session of this whole yeah. like, thing, you're going you're gonna to lead us through a very powerful prayer experience. But you just right now, just lead us in a short prayer and give us a blessing to everybody who's listening or watching. Most certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, we praise and thank you for the gift that you've given us in Christ, the path to freedom, the path to you. Lord, we invite you into each of our stories, into each of our experiences, into all of our woundedness, specifically any unforgiveness. And Lord, we just ask you to send the grace of the Holy Spirit upon us to be able to move forward in your love. And may Almighty God bless and keep you with the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. That was awesome. Thanks, man. Love you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. so much. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with somebody in your life who needs to forgive, which, by the way, is everybody. Love you guys. Thanks for watching.